Finding Your Roots by Pastor Pete Berisco. Faith isn't faith until it is all you are holding on it. There's a great big reservoir in northern Texas that has a decent sized river flowing from it. In the spring, a whole branch of water is released out of the reservoir into this river. The extra inflow raises the water level and quickens the current, which erodes all the dirt around these huge trees on the banks, exposing their enormous rocks. Lippy and I once kayaked down this gorgeous river and I was stunned at how deep those rocks went. As we drifted by these trees, I thought about Jeremiah 17. It's a contrast between people who honestly put their trust in people and people who honestly put their trust in God. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see pr uh, pr uh, prosperity when it comes. They will uh, devil in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The tree whose roots go, go down into the river of life never has to fear. The river is a constant supply of life that is always present even when bad conditions come with tough times. Choosing to consistently put your faith in God is the same thing. Put in Him the, sa uh, the same way you received Him, by grace through faith and not by words, and He will hold you up, sustain you and protect you always and forever, no matter what. Father, thank you for being a constant presence in my life. Your protection of my heart and spirit are total. Your strength encouraging and your sustain, sustenance refreshing. Show me how I can trust in you even more than I do now, so I can devil in the uh, prosperity of your spirit. Amen. I don't do patience well by Jill Berisco. Patience is just one of the fruit of the spirit listed in Galatians uh, chapter 5 part 22 to 23. But when Jill recently delivered a message to a group of university students, she candidly admitted that she is not a, an easily patient woman. But there is hope because Jesus was and is infinitely patient. Drawing richly from a story in the Old Testament, Jill teaches on the fruit of patience to help us preserve in our times of waiting, whether waiting for this pandemic to end, for a school to resume, for order and justice to prevail, for employment or for healing. If you have ever asked why God, let knowing Jesus will help you understand the fruit of patience as you live through difficult times and wait for days of joy through Holy Spirit. Amen. What we are really looking for what can wash away my sins? Nothing 
about the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other font I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Every once in a while, Hollywood nails it with gripping honesty about eternal truth. It happened long ago on TV's air. A retired police officer was dying from cancer. Nearing his end, he called the chaplain uh, into his room and he confessed his long-held guilt over allowing a man uh, he knew was innocent to be framed, convicted, and executed. Officer, how can I even hope for forgiveness? Chaplain, I think sometimes it's easier to feel guilty than forgiven. Officer, what means, uh, which means uh, what? Uh, chaplain, that maybe your guilt over his death has become your reason for living. Maybe you need a new reason to go on. Officer, I don't want to go on. Can you see I am dying? The only thing that's holding me back is that I am afraid. I am afraid of what comes next. You tell me, is atonement, atonement possible? What does God want for me? Chaplain, I think it's up to each one of us to in, uh, interpret of ourselves what God wants. Officer staring at her in bewilderment. So people can do anything? They can rape and they can murder and they can steal all in the name of God and it's okay? All I am hearing is some new age. God is love. Have it your way. Crap. No, I don't have time for this now. Chaplain. I hear that you are frustrated but you need to ask yourself. Officer. No, I don't need to ask myself anything. I need answers. And all of your questions and all of your uncertainty are only making these things worse. Howard Hedrich once said, In the midst of a generation screaming for answers, Christians are stuttering. Today, may God use us in any way he sees fit to share the simple, powerful heart of the gospel. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Gracious Father, in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Spirit, use my actions and my words to clearly communicate your truth to des uh, desperate souls today. Amen. A spark of a spontaneous prayer. Prayer is no way limited to the words squished between dear God and Amen. Prayer can be a never ceasing intimate conversation with the one who loves you. Just as you walk in the spirit moment by moment, you can continually pray in the spirit, always rejoicing, always giving thanks in never ceasing communication with him. That's what it means to pray from a place of who you are in Christ with his spirit in you to lead, intercede and transform your life in powerful ways. There is a way of ordering our mental life on more than one level at once. On one level, we can be thinking, discussing, seeing, calculating, meeting all the demands of external affairs, but deep within, behind the scenes at a profounder level, we may also be in prayer and adoration, song and worship and a gentle rest, uh, receptiveness 
to divine breathings. I would hold hands. Sometimes my family and I would hold hands around the dinner table. We would close our eyes and hop bow our heads, thanking God for food on the table, a loving family and a life worth dying for. Preaching on Sundays was sometimes somewhat similar. I would ask everyone to bow their heads and pray that God would teach us his truth. At the end of the sermon, we would bow our heads again, close our eyes, and ask God to apply what we, uh, we had learned. And once I uh, got back to my office, I, uh, I would get on my knees and raise empty hands toward heaven, spending time in intimate conversation with God who loves me. I am all for structured times of prayer like this, but prayer is no way limited to the words squished between dear God and Amen. Prayer can be a never ceasing intimate conversation with the one who loves you. Consider these scriptural truths. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Walk by the Spirit. Just as you walk in the Spirit moment by moment, you can continually pray in the Spirit, always rejoicing, always giving thanks in never ceasing communication with Him. That is what it means pray for a place of who you are in Christ with His Spirit in you to lead intercede and transform your life in powerful ways this time is not going to close with a structured prayer instead i challenge you to begin an intimate ongoing conversation right now with the god who loves you amen raising the shield again and always no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. So what is it? I asked the doctor. Either mono or lecumia, he said. For 12 days, my prayer life went through the roof as I struggled to find stability in a situation when I, where I had no control, nor certain certainty and nothing on earth that could contain my fear over and over i begged jesus to do something that he would be enough for me it was my son who was in question after all our elementary aged cameron his life was uh, teetering on <coughs> the brink of the unknown and there was nothing i could do about it well, maybe one thing, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. During those two weeks, I was suspended in the fog of uncertainty and fear. During those days, I learned to pray, Jesus, I trust you with the next 30 minutes. I know a whole b bunch of stuff is going to happen, and I give it to you. 31 minutes later, I had add, Jesus, I give you the next 30 minutes. 
Sometimes big problems affect my concentration. Instead of just fighting through it, I will take out my journal and I will write my thoughts down so I can capture them on the page and take them to Christ. I say, Jesus, I am officially giving this stuff to you. Be enough for me and take away my worry. You will be done. After 12 days, Cameron's blood showed that he had mono. While we were huge, hugely relieved, I learned again what it means to be fully honest with God. Satan's arrow will come, but God has given you the shield of faith. Lord, many eyes are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him to in God, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I am crying in you, the Lord, with my voice. You have answered me from your holy mountains. Selah! Our boiling pot, the lack of money is the rot of all evil. Many years ago, someone from the outside warned us. It was one of our church pla uh, planters from India who uh, had never been out of his country before. After a week of visiting here, somebody asked him his impression of our fi fine nation. He said this, one thing I have noticed is that the houses you built for your cars are far bigger and much nicer than the houses we have for our families. That one stopped me cold. Think about it. Garages are houses that we built for our cars while millions of people around the world are houseless and homeless. It was fair warning for a subtle but dangerous trend that we don't even seem to be aware of. Most of us can recognize a dangerous situation when it is sprung on us, but we are sus uh, susceptible to gradual danger, and unless we are warned, we will fall prey to it. Biologists say that if a frog is placed in a pot of cool water that is slowly brought to a boil, the frog will cook rather than try to jump out. I have never verified this, I swear. Sometimes we need someone who is outside the pot of water to warm us of our situation because we are obvious to be to the danger that's slowly encroaching upon us. Our friend from India did that. We, he warned us of a big danger that is encroaching upon our entire nation materialism. Scripture warns us as well. Jesus saw money as his primary competition for our heart. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is there are there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and dis the despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Have we become so comfortable and complacent in our materialism that we will allow our lives to be boiled away. 
gracious Father, I am going to need a special awareness of your grace as I address this issue with you. Search my heart, show me my ways. By the counsel of your spirit in me, give me the wisdom and the uh, willingness to align my life with the truth of your word so that I can serve you in freedom rather than serve materialists as a slave. Amen. Are you being robbed not right now? Honesty is the best policy when there is money in it. Money can rob you. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but money can steal something very precious from you. If you find yourself lulled to sleep in a materialistic environment, you will miss unfold opportunities to express and experience the love and life of Christ. The biggest mistake that we make with our money is this. We trust our money rather than God and that steals from us the words of life. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of a wealth shock the world, making it unfruitful. In Jesus' parable of the seeds, the word of God is spread over four different kinds of soils, representing four different responses to the gospel. The thorny soil represents someone who accepts the gospel and is initially excited and sacrificial, but then the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth shock the world, robbing the person of the security, joy, and freedom that can only be found in Jesus. Can money buy these things? Security? No. The next dip in the market, the next crooked investment advisor, the next greedy bank can take it all in an instant. Beyond that, even when you do have it, there is the continual insecurity that comes from the fear that it could all evap uh, evaporate tomorrow. Happiness? Sure. There are little happy moments, but excessive wealth is followed by an underlying emptiness because money didn't follow through on the promise it made me. Freedom? No, again, actually. It's the opposite. How many of our worries in life are centered around money and things? Honestly, haven't we become slaves to all this stuff? Yeah, someone can steal your money, but the odds are far, far greater that money will rob you instead. Jesus, gently but firmly, show me where I have allowed money and materials to rob me of the riches of blessings that are found only in you. By faith, for my own good, I ask that you would do some whatever it takes to ref refocus my trust on you, to place my hope in you, to serve only you. Amen. Letting God guide your generosity. The covetous man is ever in want. He who dies with the most toys wins. That's what our culture tells us. Life is found in the abundance of possessions. The more stuff you have, the better stuff you have, the happier you will be. Jesus says the exact opposite. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. 
I will tear down my bonds and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus uh, grain. And I will say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have uh, prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Yeah, money can rob us of security, happiness, and freedom. Money confuses us too. Jesus gave the word a clear warning in his opening intro to the parable. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of uh, greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Listen, I need to hear this as much as anyone. Every time I wish I had a bigger garage to store more stuff, this parable should come back to me. The problem is I think most of us want to be confused and conflicted so we don't have to obey his clear instructions. How can, how can we tell if we are confused? Ask yourself this. Are you uh, holding uh, your possessions for yourself or are you giving gener generously to things that God cares about? Comparing yourself to others doesn't count here. This is between you and God only. Are you really allowing him to guide your generosity day to day according to clear biblical principles and the leading of his spirit in you or will you die rich and foolish? God of all, right here, right now, guide my thoughts. I want to be honest. I need you to make me want to be obedient. I need your spirit to show me how. I am yours. Everything in my possession is yours. Show me the next stop of generosity. You want me to take with your stuff right now. Then show me the next step. Then the next then amen what it means to be a christian the essence of being a christian with all the talk about what it means to be a christian it's important to have a biblical response that helps you peel away all the noise about your christian identity so you can have an answer for your faith and experience the intimacy, confidence, and fulfillment that comes with your identity in Christ. Peace through prayer. The peace available through prayer simply requires you to take the initiative and start an honest and open conversation with God. He is ready and waiting to hear from you. And what better time than now when you are isolated, missing out on community and surrounded by uncertainty to take time with the one who will listen, counsel and comfort your heart like no other. Yes, this is a critical time to lean into prayer in a more international way. Is money ruling you? A great fortune is a great slavery. You probably know the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. You have probably also heard the more practical version. He who has the gold makes the rules. I have got one golden rule to add. He who owns the gold is ruled by the gold. Confusing? Let Jesus clarify it with a story. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. 
you shall not murder you shall not steal you shall not give false testimony honor your father and mother all these I have kept since I was a boy he said when Jesus heard this he said to him you still lack on uh, one thing sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me when he heard this he became very sad because he was very wealthy this man was a rich ruler yet he was really being ruled by his riches he knew something was missing in his life Jesus knew the core issue and said sell everything you have and give it to the poor then come and follow me but it is the only place in the scripture that I know of where somebody who was truly seeking Jesus left not saying yes to him. What ruled this ruler's decision? The same thing that rules so many of our decisions, money. Money can rule you, but Jesus drew the line clearly. If you want to really follow me and be a part of what I am really doing, remove the idol from its place of prominence in your life and put me there instead. And he is still saying that to each of us today. Lord Jesus, I want to take you at your word your word that is not as good as gold but infinitely better than gold i don't want to justify my love of money i don't want to compromise the simple truths you spoke speak to my heart so i can confess my sins in this area thank you for forgiving me i want to be ruled by your love live through me today amen